Hello everybody, sorry we're a little bit late, we got some technical problems here, but anyway, we are with you tonight. So on behalf of Dance by Sirona and in collaboration with Abeceda Eugino, please be welcome to this Pierce Thursday night webinar on surgical strategies to deal with an atrophic posterior maxilla. But uh, just before going deeper into the topic, let's explain what the Pierce is. The Peers is a worldwide platform for exchange and education in, you know, on research uh, and uh, science, so hence the name Peers. Uh, we have something like 100 members here in France and something like 1,000 members around the world. So uh, it's a quite large organization and uh, they are organizing a lot of uh, different activities like for example here in France uh, they organized a Peers Congress that occurred uh, two weeks ago in Cannes and they are organizing every year uh, a uh, university summit uh, on oral implantology so this year the dates are uh, are set up already it's on the 28th and 29th of January so Mm -hmm. Very important event. We, yeah, have to, we have to be there. This is yeah, it, time for science and for pleasure with friends also. Yeah, yeah. book the date, be with us and you'll see. Yeah, I mean, it's a great event. So just before introducing the guy right beside me, uh, let me tell you something. To reach our peers members all around the world, uh, the conference will be entirely in English. But a French translation is provided on the different channels, you know, uh, whether you are on Facebook or uh, YouTube, you have a French translation available. You are probably nowadays quite familiar with the webinars and you know that it's indeed possible to ask questions or to interact with us. Uh, no problem, feel free, we'll take some time to answer your questions at the end of the presentation. So we were talking about uh, some bone problems and to discuss uh, about that and to cover uh, this topic. Um, I have somebody beside me who knows a lot about bone reconstruction. I mean, he's an oral surgeon, he's a director of the Advanced uh, Reconstructive Surgery uh, Postgraduate Program at the Rothschild Hospital. He owns a private practice here in Paris. Uh, he has lecture all around the world. He has gained quite an aura. He's popular, and so I'm proud to introduce Dr. Georges Curie. So, Georges, the stage is yours now. <laughs> Thank you, Jean-Sébastien. And uh, hi, my friends. I am really pleased and happy to be with you today. I, I would like to apologize. Those who are listening in French, they will find that I have a beautiful female voice, but this is not mine. This is the translation. So please, I apologize for that, but I think you'll be more pleased with her voice than with mine in French. So let's, let's go to the topic of tonight. I'm really proud and happy to share with you this first webinar, French webinar in English, and we'll try to communicate and exchange with our friends and colleagues from all over the world, members of the peers group. And we will talk today about the atrophies of the posterior maxilla. The atrophy of the posterior maxilla can be rather uh, a sinus expansion or could be also crestal remodeling or crestal bone loss. Tonight we will talk about the first part of this lecture, the first part of this, uh, this, this area. We will speak only about the sinus and the sinus expansion and how to rebuild the bone inside the sinus. So we consider that we have a minimal crestal bone loss and we will try to focus on what is happening inside the sinus. So let's go for the lecture. Posterior maxillary atrophy can have many reasons, as you know. It could be infectious, it could be extraction, traumatic extraction, it could be accidental, it could be whatever. And at the time that we have lost this bone and in order to have the implant placed in a good in a nice, uh, for a nice reconstruction, prosthetic reconstruction, we have to take in consideration the anatomy, we have to take in consideration also the infectious aspect of the sinus or the sinuses, and we need to have some criteria in order to decide how are we going to go for this bone reconstruction. We've been publishing three to four years ago with two friends of mine, very close friend of mine, Ronald Junes and Nabi Hneder. We've been publishing a book in Springer, with, with Springer editor and this book is a guidebook which is really here just to be side chair and being able to open it and to have all the information that we need for a sinus surgery could be considering the biomaterials could be considering the complications the tearing of the membrane how to repair and whatever is concerning the sinus you can find a lot of information about that 
and uh, we, let's go and, and, and speak about that and talk about and exchange. Unhappily, we cannot discuss. Maybe, please, you can send your question. I'll do my best to, to answer if I can uh, on, on your questions. And uh, at the time that we go for a sinus surgery or we think to augment a patient in order to have implant placed, we have to consider all the paranasal sinuses. We cannot only consider the floor of the sinus. We have to have an overview of what is happening upside. We need to know what is happening in the etmoidal cells also and what is happening with the frontal. Because from time to time you can have an infection going from down and going up and could be really in some cases critical for the patients. Or you can have what you think a banal infection sinusitis which could be more than that. It could be a tumor or whatever. So this is not the topic of tonight but let's focus on the bone augmentation and the criteria of bone augmentation. As we were saying prior to, to that, the osteometal complex is very important and it's very important to have the air going through the channel of the osteum channel and also the mucus or the, the bleeding that occurs after the surgery could be evacuated for the, from the patients through this channel. This channel, this channel is really important. And this channel, where is it located? Let's take this patient. This patient came to the office for bone reconstruction for a sinus floor elevation. And let's see what is happening with this small video. You have two lines, a green one and a yellow one. The green one is just going to show you in a minute that this patient had an acute infection, was treated and had a meatotum. You can see that below the middle turbinate, there is an opening, there is a hole communicating with the nose. She had a surgery and why did she have that surgery? She had a surgery because she had an infection, bilateral infection. And if you can see here, the ostia, the ostiums are really small. The channel is very, very tinny, very tight, especially on the right side. So that was the reason why probably she had an infection and they needed to have the meatotomy in order to evacuate or the infection or the pus, which was collected inside the sinus. The history of that is very important and there is a great man behind that. Hill Tatum was the first one to perform the first sinus floor elevation lateral window. He's well known for that in 1977. But what we don't know, what we know uh, uh, also that what we don't know also is that the first crestal approach done was done by Hill Tatum also. And that was done and was a little bit complicated in order to achieve what was considered at that time as being the target, putting longer implant that we can have. We had smooth implants and we used to put very, very long implants as we will see in a minute. After that, three years ago, Phil Boyd, a close friend of him uh, from the same university, published the first paper about the sinus bone augmentation, about the lateral approach and the sinus lift. That was, uh, that was the really first paper just putting the... Uh, putting in, uh, in, the, in our hands the method and the, the, tra the, the, uh, the strategy to augment bone in the posterior area. But at that time, we observed, they observed, that resorption occurs if implants were not placed. We know that it's not true. What happens at that time, we were used, they were used, and we were used, as, as we started in the early 90s, to use autogenous bone harvests from the ilium. We used to use autogenous bone in the sinus. And this bone will resorb in time independently if there is implant or not. So the indication, first classification came from Karl Misch. Karl Misch classified in 87 uh, the first, you know, uh, protocol in order to choose between uh, implant placement, simple implant placement, lateral approach or crestal approach. At that time, he considered that less than eight millimeters requires a sinus lift, lateral approach for a sinus lift. And if we had uh, from 8 to 12 millimeters, it was an indication for a crestal approach. That might be surprising. And the implant placement requires at least 12 millimeters in order to be achieved. And that was the time where we were using long implants, as I told you, between 15 to 21 implants. I've been putting implants of 21 millimeters. And that, what, that time was really something that today, today is considered totally useless. The consensus of 2015 is closer to what we are considering today, but you will see that it's not exactly what we are doing. Everything is moving, everything is going in a quicker way, every go everything is going in a simplest procedure. But the consensus of 2015 fixed the three classifications. The class one was an RBH, residual bone height, more than 7 millimeters. 
and it was an indication for short implant without augmentation. Could be wider implant, we used to, do use, to use that, but we know that regular implant in 7 millimeters could today work in quite well uh, with, with a quite good pro prognosis. The class 2 was from 5 millimeters to 6 millimeters. It could be considering short implants with large plates, or it could be also a sinus lift, crystal, or lateral approach depending of the density that was considered regarding the density. And today we know that the density has nothing to do with the bone stability after that. Even if we have poor bone at the time that we have a trauma, at the time that you are placing an implant in place, the healing will give higher density. The trauma will ensure a remodeling and that will give us more density at the final end. So even that, you know, not too far, seven years ago is not quite exactly what we know today about bone healing and bone uh, bone loading and the third class was less than five millimeters and was considered as being a requirement for a lateral approach simultaneous implant placements simultaneous implant placement depends on the implant shape that depends on the bone density many factors but in order to classify that we considered that we need at least five millimeter to put a conventional implant if you have five millimeters or more and you need to do a sinus floor elevation, could be crystal, could be lateral, whatever, depending on the anatomy and different factors. If you have five millimeters, you can put any implant in place. And this is the topic of today. Today, which implant to place with very low uh, high height bone with RBH around two millimeters, what could be the most indicated implant and what would be the shape, not the implant, not the uh, topograph, but the topography of the implant. And a recent publication reported also that we can put it in one millimeter, that we can put the implant at the same time in a range between one to two millimeters. It is something possible. It is something really predictable. And we will consider that at the end of the lecture. The consensus is about two to four millimeters is with a high density of bone, we can place an implant, but take care depending on the shape and we will describe what could be the ideal shape for that and what are the things that we need to avoid even in two millimeters or four millimeters something that we don't need to have uh, apologize for that i have a small technical problem um, arno please may i ask you i have a signal here of low battery you have please my uh, uh my charger there no, i don't yeah. notice that you know, so maybe. normally when we have a technical problem, you know, we, there's always another technical problem that will go over the top. No, of the no, other no, one. no, no problem. Everything is under control. Oh, everything is on, everything under, everything control. Is under control. Yeah, exactly. So. Please. Merci. For the replay, that will be cut. You know, when we will do the replay for that, we will ask Abyssidan to cut that part and then put it by side. Merci Arnaud. <laughs> oh. Is everything okay for you? Yeah. Hmm. So, so I, will, I yeah, think, I, I, yeah, I think uh, we are on the way. In a minute. To find, yeah, to find a, to find a good solution. So I, I, I may ask you one uh, very first question. You know. Okay. The thickness of the membrane. I read a couple of papers where they discuss that uh, the membrane uh, should be less than two millimeter uh, thick in order to consider uh, uh, bone grafting. Uh, so, what do you think about that? Is it uh, an important factor? Should we consider the bone? Uh, I think uh, if if we are facing a very thick membrane, we can have some connective tissue inside, and that connective tissue could also proliferate and compromise the uh, the bone substitute inside so i think there are many factors and the most important factor is what we are placing as bone substitute regarding the thick membrane and the thick membrane could give us some kind of security because of reflecting it is easier and we are more secured in order to elevate it but also this is something that we observe when you have a communication between the sinus membrane and the connective tissue mm -hmm. when you have a fistula in, in this situation, we know that the connective tissue can proliferate in contact of the biomaterials. So it's very simple. I think it's not really easy to imagine, but at the time that we have a thick membrane, in my opinion, we have to, plus, uh, to place a membrane, uh, um, a collagen membrane, in order to isolate that, that, that membrane from the, bio, the bone substitute. Okay. 
Okay, let's go to the, uh, to the lecture. Sorry for that. Um, two to four millimeters. We are saying regarding the bone sensitivity, at the time that you have bone stability, we can place the implant if we have, you know, uh, stabilization around 20 newton centimeter. But the shape of the implant is very important. When you place it in two to four millimeters, and we will see some complications, uh, it's not enough to be, to be sure that everything will go in, in a good way. So modalities for sinus elevation, you know it, it's crystal approach and it's also the lateral approach. The crystal approach could be done by osteotomy without any bone substitute. We can gain from two to three millimeters. That also was, you know, uh, teached by Tatum uh, very, very early, you know, so that was something that we, we learned from him in the early 90s. And the internal membrane preparation, this what is also called the Summers technique, uh, requires uh, or bone condensation and also could require some bone substitutes placed in order to elevate the membrane having a kind of pressure developed in an equal uh, way on all around the, all, all on the surface of this membrane. We can use also different devices like the balloon, the hydraulic uh, pressure. We're not going to go through those details. The, the approach today is for atrophic maxilla and we'll go, we're going just to see one case with a crystal approach just to give you a trick, a small thing that you can bring home today because it is something that I observed which is very very important in order to avoid complication with the crystal approach. So let's go for that. The crystal approach is actually acquiring uh, uh, a lot of efforts from the industry to develop devices that can help us for that. So we had uh, the, the manual you know, impaction, now we are moving to mechanical uh, impaction and the last one that I received last week is electrical Stim electrical stimuli with very high and very short impact which elevates and can create the uh, it can and can create you know the pressure on the on the floor of the sinus in order to break the floor and also to add the biomaterial in a very very comfortable way for the patient high impact but very short time and we will speak about that and we'll publish that a little bit later so the crystal approach could be more secured at the lateral one than the lateral one but it's not really 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 something that happens all the time because at the time that everything is broken and all the materials flow blow into the sinus the complication might be higher and in this situation we need one thing open a lateral window so for those who are starting to do crystal approach at the time that you are putting biomaterials you have to have training in order if you have a complication to be able to go from lateral approach to complete it with a lateral approach remove all the materials and secure your bone augmentation. So that is an opinion. And something which really amazed me. All the classifications speak about residual bone height in order to have a crystal approach. But this is something not really true. Let's consider. I have three millimeters and I want to gain two millimeters. So can we consider that three millimeter is the minimal height for crystal approach? If I need to augment seven millimeters is three millimeters the good approach for having seven millimeters gain so what i'm trying to say is that the residual bone is not important the most important thing is just how do i need to gain how what is the, the minimal uh, volume that i need to gain the minimal height that i need to gain in order to put the implant that i have chosen if you are you know confident with a short implant with big plates and this implants you can use it in a more safe way gaining two or three millimeters then maybe two millimeters will be the good way for a crystal approach or it could be three millimeters but if you are using a smooth implant and you need to obtain seven eight millimeters even if you have four millimeters maybe that will not be the good implant for the crystal approach so we have to consider the crystal approach not regarding the implant shape or the implant size but also regarding the gain that we need to obtain so let's say that from two to three millimeters, crystal approach is okay without bone substitutes. Four to five millimeters, it could be a crystal approach in a general way, for sure. But for more than that, maybe we need a lateral approach. But I have many friends and many persons around us and me from time to time, we can obtain more with hydraulic pressure, with hydraulic biomaterials. We can obtain some, big, some gains which can go more than eight or nine millimeters, but it's not a protocol to put in all hands. The advantage is, you know, that people are less anxious, people are less traumatized by the surgery. Uh, it's a in less invasive surgery. The morbidity is very low, but we can describe some, some problems regarding the, the, uh, the jaw with the patient, the, the, uh, the articulation of the patient regarding the impact. The immediate implantation most of the time is achieved. 
unless we have broken something and we have broken the membrane and the biomaterial is is blowing maybe we can we can decide to 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 abandon the, the procedure if we cannot do a lateral window shorter intervention i'm not sure depending on the way you are treating depending on the size if you have four implants if you need to do a crystal approach for four implants it will take you longer time than having a lateral approach so depending on the surgery you are doing limitations okay you know them it's a blind surgery at that time you cannot control what is happening maybe during the impact everything is going well but at the time you are putting the biomaterials in place maybe you can tear the membrane and if it's lacerated you cannot see it you can see it only on the control when the patient is going out of the office so this is one of the most important things. we have some tricks to control to control the the uh, the the integrity of the membrane but that could be done only on the early stage you just inject some serum and if something all the serum is going down from the same uh, uh, hole of the uh, of the drilling it means that the membrane is 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 okay but at the time we put the biomaterials you cannot do that anymore we used to consider that infectious risk is the same i'm not sure i think infectious risk is lower for two reasons one of the major reasons of the infection of the sinus are the bacteria coming from the mouth at the time that we have an open window we increase the infection possibility at the time they are impacting we have a very small hole it's vertical most of the time we have less infection risks i think and the second reason for that is that the time you are impacting biomaterials bone substitutes whatever at the time that you am you impact it you crush it and as you are crushing it you are pushing it in the sinus and even if it breaks it became small particles and those small particles could be eliminated by the patient very easily at the time that you are doing a lateral approach using the same bone substitute if you have a tearing membrane in this situation you may increase the risk of infection for sure and the bad experience related to the to the osteum we had already uh, we have already spoken about that the radiology what kind of radiology do we need we need a ct scan the first reason just to be sure that the sinus the sinuses are free of any infection of any pathology but the reason also is the axis of the elevation if you took a panoramic and you try to do an elevation for this patient for instance do not consider the the uh, the thickness of the bone just consider only the height and the direction if we consider that you have a larger bone than this one and we try to do a sinus elevation we will do a nasal elevation and this is not exactly the same thing so we need a ct scan in order to be sure the direction we are choosing for that so sure this situation is not a good one so let's go for a step by step and give you the trick that i spoke about it's a very simple case we have six millimeters we can gain two to three millimeters without putting any biomaterials but that was years ago and i have decided to put some biomaterials and i would give you just the uh, you know the first the the, the the most important steps drilling is done but we keep the last drill till the end we don't use the last drill before putting the biomaterial inside i will tell you in a minute why after we, are, we have drilled and kept the last millimeter to be broken by the osteotomes we go for impaction we break the last millimeter and we do not enter the sinus at the time that we just gain 0.5 or 1 millimeter we have to stop and every time at that time we can put the biomaterial inside before that you can use a probe and the the astra probe is quite good for that because it's very smooth round and very smooth not aggressive and you can evaluate also the height of the bone not only regarding the ct scan or observing the ct scan but also probing and trying to see if it's exactly the same place that you are uh, placing the implant than the one you see, have seen on the CT scans. You can see the height, you can just probe laterally the windows and define what is really the height you are putting the implant in. And I'm comfortable to use a, a biomaterial, you know, like uh, hydraulic biomaterials mixed with, uh, with any gel, or it could be also collagen matrix containing hydroxyl apatite and this is what i'm using here i'm using a collagen membrane with hydroxyl apatite it's impacted hydrated priorly and impacted never entering the sinus you can see here the osteotomes they never enter the sinus they go exactly to the same size less one millimeter the same size that we had prior to the uh, to this to the uh, to the elevation of the floor at the end you can see on the lower side on the lower slide sorry and the lower left image that the inner part of the area is white and this is biomaterial at the time that you impact in spongy bone you have some inclusion of particulated hydroxyl apatite which will fit enter 
into the spongy bone. And if you compress that with the implant placement, you may have some inflammation and pain. And at the time that I've modified the technique, like I'm showing you here, I stopped having, I never had any more inflammation after this uh, after sinus crustal ele uh, elevation, not any pain. So we use the last drill not to achieve the crystal uh, preparation, but to remove all those particles which are included in the spongy area. And we're going to use the counter sink here. The counter sink is used and you can see with the probe in, in place, just being sure that we still have the contact with the spongy bone, with the spongy collagen membrane that have been put in inside. We still have the contact, the firm contact. We have to move it very gently. And we can see also that around there is no more hydroxyl apatite, hydroxyl apatite uh, in, uh, inside the alveolar, uh, the alveolar bone and the implants could be placed in a very simple way. Regarding the bone stability, the implant stability, sorry, around 30 newton centimeters, could be between 25 to 30, something like that. We can put the healing abutment, but you know about that. And this is the situation after healing and everything was working good well. mineralization gain bone gain here was about like four millimeters and was quite enough so the indication for lateral approach regarding the consensus of 2015 is for less than five millimeters could be done in expert hands we can do a crystal approach but let's keep this five millimeters you know as a general uh, evaluation of what requires a sinus floor elevation what kind of tools do we need for that? We can lose burrs, we can lose burrs with diamonds or with tungsten, you know, with, uh, but we can also use a piezo surgery. And with the piezo surgery, we have two kinds of tools that we can use. Uh, first one, the, uh, the saw, you know, the cutting edge. And the second one are the diamond balls, like a rotative instrument. We can see that in this publication, we have more perforations occurring when you are using the saw rather than using the diamond, both of them with the piezo surgery. You know, they are insert of piezo surgery, both of them. And I'm not sure that it's the, all the situations are very simple like that. Because if you have a thick bone, you augment the risk using, uh, using uh, uh, you know, uh, a diamond insert. You increase the risk because you cannot remove easily the plate. So I think something this is something that needs to be evaluated. I need to stop the sound. Okay, let's go for first case here just to show you the safety of the piezo surgery and why the piezo surgery is really helpful. It's an amazing that was done during a life surgery. With the, where that life surgery occurs in the University of St. Joseph in Lebanon years ago. And we're going to see how the piezo acts, how the piezo works. and using those two tools that we spoke about, the saw and the diamond. I don't use the diamond burr, round one, I use the rectangular one and you will see what. This is the saw, we just define very easily, we define very easily the limits of the perforation. This is a very thin, very very thin bone. You can see the darkness of, uh, of the osteotomy, the darkness area, this is the mucosa. It's a very 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 thin mucosa. It opens, you can see, in a very, very quick way. Bone is less than 0.5 millimeters. And the saw is working in a, good way, in a good way. The most important is not to use it straight pushing, but having it, you know, angulated to the bone. And this is the quadrangular, uh, the qu quadrangular insert that I use with diamonds. And this is for the lateral side. And this is for the reflection of the mucosa. And... I'm going to show you something really not very common because it was not planned to be like that. I was doing that surgery with one of my friends. I think it was Nabi at that time. And we were reflecting. And at that time, we used to keep the lateral window in sight. And after reflection, he told me, George, you told me that you want to remove the window. And now how are you going to do that? And I was a little bit, you know, uh, under pressure. And I said, OK, I have the piezo and I'm sure about the precision and the safety of the piezo. So let's remove it from inside the sinus. And this is the way that it was done. It was done just holding the lateral window and using, like an elevator, using the insert just to push and release the membrane. 
and release the, uh, the lateral wall from the membrane. And you can see it in a minute after we, we remove the, uh, the lateral window. You can see that the color is dark, the mucosa is dark, it means that it's a very thin one. After that, we put some collagen matrix. I always use a collagen matrix, not only a membrane, not always a membrane, a collagen matrix, because I consider every time that we have a very uh, thin mucosa, after you put the material inside and you compress them inside, the bone substitutes, you may have a third membrane by the biomaterial also. So I have it, I, I use it just like having it more, more simple to place the, the bone substitute and reducing the risk. That was also a bone expansion, but it's not the subject. Putting the bone substitute in place and going closing the window and replacing the window after. I'm going to reduce just that. Okay. What are the healing phases after sinus floor elevation? We have, it happens like any biomaterial, like any bone substitute, like any healing. The first clot is the most important thing. At the time that we have blood, we have a blood clot formation and it turns to fibrous tissue followed by cell recruitments. Those cell recruitments will just bring through the vascularization through the vessels will bring the pre-osteoclast, the osteoclast activity, and after the osteoblast activity, we'll remodel the bone and we'll remodel the bone substitute and remodeling occurs for a long term after that. So nothing really different when you have uh, a bone substitute in, in a general way. Uh, I mean, not really different of what happens with bone, bone healing normally. But most important, what are the factors that influence this healing? They are exactly also the same the same thing that you have in a general health or in different areas. Reduced vascularity of the sinus is something which was considered as being one major risk of non-integration of bone substitute. But it seems that it's not really effective because even with the thin mucosa, we know that we have no, not a lot of vessels, but we can see that we have good integration of the bone substitute, good remodeling of the bone substitute. But there are many, probably other factors that we have to take in consideration. Reducing oxygen tension was also considered as being a fact, but it's not something really we have, in, we keep in consideration today. Systemic disease, yes, sure. Smoking habits, yes, sure. Implant surface, implant surface, sure, because at the time that you have a smooth implant, bone growth on the surface will not be as strong as you can have it on a rough surface, but reverse of that, you have more preimplantitis. So this is another consideration. We don't have to speak about that today. The bone substitute is very important. Regarding the quality, the, the origin of the bone substitute, you have a quicker bone healing or a lower bone healing. And this is related to the nature and the chemical components of the biomaterials. We'll speak about in a minute. Anat anatomical variables. The residual bone height, the size of the sinus, may influence the time of healing. It will not influence the ending of the healing. If you take in consideration that you wait six or eight months, probably the things will turn in the same way. But if you consider a conventional time, around four months, if you have a very large cavity, very large sinus, probably materials will not be remodeled in the same way. And this is just a case, just to show you, if you can see what is the uh, uh, what is the size of the sinus? Sorry, I don't have a pointer just to show you, but you can see that w the sinus is coming just behind the lateral incisor. And if you measure this area and you go to the tuberosity where there is no bone, you have a very, very large sinus. It's something like three centimeters or more, four centimeters, because that was a huge man. And also, if you consider the, the bone around, the bone walls, it's only cortical, not any medullar. So in th this case, we may consider that remodeling of the bone substitute will take longer time than a, sh a small area where limited with medullar bone. What about bone substitute? What could be the best biomaterial for bone substitute? Bone activity is well known. It's depending on three ways, osteogenesis, osteoinduction, and osteoinduction. Autogenous bone, may induce some osteogenesis if this is vital bone. But at the time that you harvest bone, this is not anymore 
vital bone. At the time that you harvest the bone, it will take you maybe 12 to 13 minutes or 20 minutes or half an hour just to harvest it, prepare the site and put it in place. And the survival rate of the cells is very, very, very low if you go very quickly. If you do a bone graft, there is no bone survivor. It's only dead bone. So we have an inductive activity under the dependence of the BMPs and you have osteoconductive property which takes longer time but I, in my opinion the osteoconductive property is the most important. This is the characteristic of the bone substitute and this gives in my opinion the quality of the bone substitute. Conduction is the major thing to consider when we are using a bone substitute. If we look to the literature and that was published in the, in the, uh, in the book that we have, uh, we have published uh, three years ago we know that autogenous bone resorption is the highest rate. It resorbs very quickly and a recommendation from all the authors is to use non-resorbable or slowly resorbable biomaterial in order to achieve bone reconstruction prior to the, to the remodeling or the resorption of the bone substitute. Here, the autogenous graft. The autogenous graft is a bone substitute also. If we take the properties of the xenograft. We know from the literature and also from our experience, from all our experiences, that it shows the highest bone stability in the sinus floor elevation. This is the most stable and the more predictable in long-term survival. We can consider that you have more infection, yes. We can consider that you can have more complication with it during the post-operative healing, might be. But at the time that the bone reconstruction is achieved, we have the higher stability with that kind of biomaterial regarding the others. And this is what we can see, you know, in terms of density, of volume, what we can see with the sinus floor elevated with hydroxylapatite, bovine hydroxylapatite, with the xenograft. Uh, if we consider some other biomaterials, alloplastic materials, we, we have many alloplastic biomaterials, bioglass, TCP, HA, and the conclusion that we had, if we consider each one of them, that we have not... A fantastic result regarding the sinus floor elevation and regarding those biomaterials you know the uh, the lack of information is very important to the potential to support newly formed bone in time but things are moving uh, I have started to work on alloplastic materials very early in 94 and in 95 with Leuven University in Belgium we've been working on the biogra and the bioglass and those histology were done from uh, from patients I have treated and we can see that the bioglass incorporate very well. We have all the orange uh, colors that you can see are newly formed bone and we can see it growing all inside the sinus. Uh, and that was really exciting at that time to find that we have this good integration, this beautiful bone formation. And uh, But the story is quite different and this is what happens you know in time. We can see that using here a 15 millimeters implant, uh, stereos implants for those who remember them. And we can see here that we have lost a big part of the bone and part of the implants are pro pro protrud protruding into the sinus. This is not a problem. Implants are still in place. From a clinical point of view, it works well. But at the time that you are using a bone substitute and regarding what we know a bone, bone substitute, we would like to know which one to use in order to maintain it in time. This is something really important for us. At that time, also during this early 90s, mid-90s, uh, mid, mid I started using a mix of autogenous, higher resorbable, with alloplastic, HA, dense biomaterial. And this is an amazing case. Here, bone were harvested from the chain, mixed with, with uh, hydroxylapatite, and you can see implant in place. Those are stereos implants, or very old implants also. And you can see, if you can see to the floor, uh, you can see the floor of the sinus, we move from dark, no bone, to gaining density independently of the apex of the implants. Quite different from the bioglass that we've been using in the case before. And this is what happens years after. We can see that the sinus floor is quite independent from the implant placement or the implant support. So the mix of very slow resorbable biomaterials is something really interesting and this is how it goes in time. In the publication that we had also we spoke about allografts. Allografts were considered as very promising, very very strong bone formation, very quick bone formation, but those allografts 
derived at that time from spongy bone resorb like spongy bone. It doesn't work in a very good way. So we use more cortical bone, cortical mixed with spongy bone, but the problem is the origin and this is not the subject today, so I will not speak about. What is important in the collagen, in the allograft is the presence of collagen matrix. It's like autogenous bone. We have something like 30% uh, ma uh, collagen matrix in the structure of the bone and this leads to very quick angiogenesis and this is something really interesting because at that time we can recruit vessels very quickly blood clot is very stable we recruit vessels very quickly and all the cascade of cells will happen in a very good way we have been studying and a follow-up of 50 sinuses follow-up for 10 years but we can see with spongy allogenic bone in the sinus exactly the same thing that we saw with the ilium uh, with the ilium filling, with the ilium bone filled into the sinus in, from the early 90s. The calcium phosphate based ceramics. So we go now and we work a lot with mix, highly resorbable biomaterial and very slow resorbable materials. We use that for the what I call the the uh, the uh, hybrid bone regeneration. This is not the subject. But here we can see something used with a mix of HA and TCP and we obtain exactly the same thing that you saw with the mix of autogenous and very low, very high dense hydroxylapatite. You can see that the floor of the sinus is well defined now. It, it was an elevated sinus, you will see this case in a minute. Uh, and that was not the, the, the initial level of the sinus. This is the case of a patient. This patient requires you know, a double correction. It needs, we need to correct the crest, it's a combined defect and also elevate the sinus. So let's go for just a step by step, tooth, tooth were removed here six weeks ago, six weeks before, and we go for the lateral approach, lateral window, after that sinus uh, mucosa elevation, and I used a biphasic, a biphasic biomaterial, it's a mix of calcium phosphate, TCP and HA. And the ratio, you can see it on the slide, the HA was something like 20%. So very limited, very uh, low quantity of hydroxylapatite, but majorly it's TCP 80-80%. This is synthetic, you know, this is alloplastic, a mix exactly the one, like the one that we've been using with autogenous and the, uh, the dense hydroxylapatite. The filling was done, the membrane was stabilized on the apex side, and on the surface, as we know that the xenograft is the more stable, xenograft was used just to cover the surface. Inside the sinus, we know that it will work in a good way, but for, for, the, for the volume of, of the bone, increasing the volume of the bone outside the limit of the bone, uh, the xenograft is indicated in this situation. The membrane is stabilized by pins, very simple case, and the reconstruction and the healing at four months. I didn't choose here, um, uh, a non-resorbable with titanium reinforced membrane because it was useless. In this area there were no consideration of aesthetic requirements so I, I've been using a resorbable membrane which is more safe, you know, less complication observed with, this, with the collagen members regarding the, uh, the PTFE uh, with titanium reinforced membranes. This is the entry. The entry at four months we can see a, a very good incorporation of the xenograft on the surface of the bone and the healing was very, 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 uh, very, very nice in, on, on the CT scan. Using Simplant here, procedure, implants were placed, drilling is done, and you can see that the bleeding is very high inside. It's a highly bleeding uh, bone, implants were placed. You can see on this, uh, on this panoramic uh, that there is no defined floor for the sinus. Please observe that and let's see how it will go in time. Implants are placed, we still not see, prosthesis is placed, sorry, and we still not see the floor of the sinus unless we go and do a CT scan. And this is what we observed on the CT scan. We have a highly cortical uh, floor of the sinus, which is really independent from the apex of the implants. Why does it happen? If we remember what we have seen with the autogenous bone mixed with the hydroxylapatite, we know that slowing the resorbability will let we leave the time, we let the bone grow, and in this situation we have a reorganization of the, uh, of the bone independently from the implant placement or the, the implant support. 
and those x-ray one year more later we can see that you have an increase of the density we have really very defined with spines the spines are very interesting because it means that the pressure of the sinus is not remodeling or resorbing here we have no expansion of the sinus when we have that kind of biomaterial in place what happens and we know it and we saw it when we have periimplantitis in those cases and we remove the implants and let it heal we have bone reconstruction very important volume of bone reconstruction even better than the one that we have in pristine bone in non-augmented area we have more less resorption than if it was pristine bone and this is another view also with the independent you know re-architecture of of the floor of the of the sinus okay before going to sinus surgery we have to be aware of the sinus pathologies and this is very important i'm going to show you some of them we don't have time because it, it will take hours to, to speak about that and we'll speak about foreign body inflammation and infection we'll speak about oroenteral fistula and we'll speak about anatomical factors the three the last three of them root apical pathologies you know it quite well probably better than i sinus pathologies can be observed with you know a foreign body this is a case without any inflammation without any infection the implant moved in the sinus and the abutment also but in this situation do we need to remove them this patient had no symptoms had that for years ago because he didn't notice he didn't notice even that something was inside and the surgeon probably didn't tell him what happened but when he came to the office for a normal x-ray there were no infection nothing and in this situation we don't do anything just let it in peace relate to ease it was for years here without any inflammation without any infection Nariglax is the same here another situation with an, an acute infection in the sinus it's a foreign body and in this situation we have a disorder in the sinuses and you can so also on those slides that the ethmoidal cells are concerned are starting to be concerned by the infection we need to treat that patient we need to remove that and clear all the infection if you have an oroenteral fistula what do you do what we mean by oroenteral fistula it means that you have a communication air communication between the sinus and the mouth if you have a disconnection rupture of the floor it's not an oral it's not a fistula and it's not an oroenteral fistula it's just a disruption of, of the of the crest at the time that you can see that you have resonance here you can see on the slide you have an inflammation of the sinus and the patient reports history of infection repeated infection first we need to close this fistula here is you know round flap down soft tissue are reflected into the sinus from around the fistula and then a pediculated flap is rotated closing it and the time that you obtain the healing and this is six a few weeks after that was maybe 15 days after the infection of the sinus is going to vanish because there is no more communication between the the, the mouth and, and and the sinus and in this situation you can go for a normal procedure with immediate implant placement or not immediate placement but the most important thing do not consider that you can do with the, in those situation that you can do a sinus elevation and close with this this fistula some cases were reported putting the implant in in the place where this communication was existing but you are taking a major risk and we don't want to take major risk with the patients we have to be safe and that was done in immediate sinus floor elevation and implant placement after that anatomical factors anatomical factors may be surprising and in this situation you have to be very careful selecting the good biomaterial for those kind of surgeries here is uh, something that we didn't notice he, this patient came reporting you know some disturbance some occasional disturbance no infection related to the sinus uh, we can see a very small image apical image on the premolar first premolar but is not connected to the sinus and he reported some problems and we we have and the the the, the less molar has to be extracted and the sinus floor elevation was recommended but when i took the ct scan after the extraction what we saw is something that you have to notice and take care about we can see here a transversal septum this transversal septum limits the airflow into the sinus and we can see here that we have a thickness and inflammation of the mucosa in this situation we have to be very careful because if we have an inflammation it means that aeration you know the flow the air circulation in the sinus is not optimal the mucus evacuation the mucus uh, blowing 
uh, nose blowing is not really uh, happening in, in, in normal way, in a physiological way, physiological way, and in this situation you may face an infection. So the thing that you need to do here is first remove that. This patient was premedicated, conventional, amoxicillin, clavulanic acid, and corticoids. And a few days after, I went and removed this septum. It was a very large septum. It was removed from the middle. You can see it on the left image. I removed it totally, and I did a bone substitute graft into the sinus. But I was really concerned about the infection prior to that, and I choose to use a spongy bone, even if I may face resorption in time. I, uh, I, I wanted to have something which has a big collagen matrix, a huge collagen matrix, 30%, in order to have a quick clot just stable inside and having a very quick vascularization of the sinus. And happens what probably had to happen. The patient, this is the CT scan after, there's a hemosinus, just some bleeding, it was bleeding a lot. And we can see here that there is some lack of bone filling. Is it the reason or not? I don't know. But the patient came eight days after with an infection. Nose blowing, pus, and we had to change the antibiotic. I took an x-ray and I saw that something is not going in a good way. I gave him some corticoids for two days and changed the antibiotic. The control of, at seven, eight days is very fundamental for all the augmentation procedures. It's something that you have to repeat. This is something really, really important. So when I give the patient the antibiotics, he came 15 days after and did a new control. And what I saw inside was exactly what I was expecting, an intra bone substitute, bone materials fistula. It was not going outside the mouse, it just going into the sinus. And this is the chimney, this is you know the fistula which brought the infection from the inner part of the biomaterial, the bone substitute, to the sinus. But that was, remember, spongy bone with 30% collagen. After this uh, second medication, this second medication, I did a CT scan at three months. We can see that everything is not really clear at that time. Everything is not clean enough, but it's on the good way. No symptomatology. The patient did not report any trouble after that. And this is the CT scan at four months. Everything has vanished, bone is formed, and everything is in a good way just to go for implant placement. I know that this bone substitute in time will reduce. I know that I will lose some bone, but the implant will remain in place. So that was a kind of compromise that I had to take regarding the infection risk and regarding also the bone stability that I was talking about. So here you have the three steps from acute infection to three months to four months and the decision of implant placement. Foreign body, implant migration. And this is a very important topic. Why implant migrates? They migrate because they are not stable. Why they are not stable? Because maybe the bone height is not enough, maybe because the bone density is not good enough, and probably because the implant shape is not the good one. And we have to be very careful. Good implants does not exist for in all cases, in all situations. We have to choose the one which corresponds to the area we are dealing with. And this is a friend of mine. She came from after travel and she had an implant placed and this implant migrates into the sinus. She had a sinus surgery at the same time and the implant migrates inside. And that implant migrates, so I had to remove it. And we will try to see why we need to be very careful about implant selection. After, you know, infection, uh, the, the infection is, is, uh, is uh, resolved, we have to go back and then rebuild the patient. I'll go back to this slide. Sorry, I've forgotten. This is what I summarized. We have inadequate bone implant choice, inadequate bone drilling. It's not the density of the bone, but it's also the way you are drilling, the way you are just achieving the preparation of the site, which is really important. And also, on the opposite side, an excessive torque will lead to bone resorption, and bone resorption will lead to bone, in, uh, to bone migration. So having a high torque is highly risky in the sinus. In the mandible, you will lose bone on the crest. In the sinus, it will go into the sinus. It will migrate into the sinus. We have resolved the infection site, so we need to remove that amazing implant. This is a 3D implant. Uh, something like a 3D lock. First time I saw that, you know, the implant is placed and is locked by another plate, which is horizontal. 
amazing way. So we had to remove it. It was quite complicated to understand how to remove that because first we had to unscrew the implant from the plate and after to remove the plate. I had a tiered membrane, a small, a small, a small tiered membrane and we have to rebuild, isolate it. And it was an architecture which is really uh, not, not suitable for immediate implant placement. In those situations, you have to re reconstruct the crest, do the uh, bone elevation, and then secure the volumes and come back and restore the patient in a more conventional way. This is something that was done and achieved. It took a long time, it took more than a year to achieve that. What is inadequate implant topography? There are many cases. At the time that you are dealing with low crestal bone, residual crestal bone, you cannot have an implant with a reduced coronal diameter because if you have a reduced coronal diameter, then the implant will migrate into the sinus after remodeling starts. And you need to have something like a retention. Crestal threads are very important. And also the shape of the implants, the shape, conical shape. Because at the time that you are dealing with very low a very small crystal bone remaining at that time when you put a conical implant it cannot go into the sinus it cannot go in sinus unless you do uh, a bed ring and if we consider the implant the implant that you are speaking here showing in this situation um, it's well known I i've been working with densply for a while I, I was one of the beginners to work with astratech implants but this is not the reason actually till today i have no implants from other companies which provide me the same safety in implant placement in this area. I'm not doing a commercial approach at all. And please look around you. If you find something, please send me an email. We have here micro threads. Micro threads are considered as being a problem with when you have preimplantitis, probably. Surface might be in consideration also, probably. But regarding only this fact that we have very small bone, one millimeter 0.5 or something like that, we need to have a high contact with the, th with the micro threads that the mask respect can provide and also having a conical shape means that while remodeling the implant cannot be impacted into the sinus it cannot migrate into the sinus so every pitch you know the pitch is the distance of every micro thread is 0 0.22 millimeters as you can see on the white slide on the white image it means that one macro thread from the same company is equal to three micro threads and now you, you can see that in this area we can have a very high stability even in very thin bone so i tried to imagine if i have 1.5 millimeters i have seven micro threads inserted in the residual bone and this is quite enough to achieve 25 to 30 newton centimeters not more we can have 40 but we don't want we have to be limited not and try to avoid excessive compression of the sinus so let's see this case this is interesting case bilateral sinus that was done during a workshop uh, we have, you know, the ostium, we can we have to control the freedom of the ostium, the lack of uh, no pathogens are observed, neither in the maxillary sinus, the etmoidal cells or the frontal cells. Everything was, was clear, clean enough. And if we consider the CT scan, we can see here in the project that you are having that we have on the left side, this is the, uh, the image that you can see on the left side of the patient that we have a regular crest and especially we have dark areas i cannot point on it but if you can look on uh, on the slide that you have on the right side you can see that you have black areas especially on the upper and the middle line which means that we have a crest which is not really uh, mineralized we have some inflammation residual inflammation in in this area so this is not an indication for implant placements on the right side that will be the next slide that the next slide, I tried to imagine what could be the implant placement. Here, crystal bone was present. I had 1.6 millimeters for the first implant in the first smaller area, N16. You can see N1.6 limited, but 1.8 on each side. And on number 17 here, I have 2.5 millimeters, 2.7 and 2.1 millimeters on each side. In this situation, I think we can achieve implant placement in a very safe way. Here is the superposing, the, the, the positioning of the implant. It's a 4.5 millimeters implant, old astratic implant, TX implant. And uh, is, this one will be placed in, in, the, in, the, in, on, in the first molar site and the second will go and fit in the second molar site. So 
how does it work? Let's see how I was treated these patients. I was supposed to do a live surgery last time, but for different reasons we had to abandon that, and that was one of the cases that was probably that would have been treated for for that live surgery. Well, it will be for another time. We can see the, we're going to treat both lateral sites during the same surgery. Here you can see that the ostium are clear, the channels are clear. This is the area where this is reversed. Huh? This is the area on the left side where bone was not good enough, and this is the area where we'll focus with the implant placement. On the left side, we had the same topography for the first molar, but on the posterior side, we had a lack of uh, the crestal side. The crestal bone was not good enough. We have a regular. We had a regular crests. So we'll start with the left side. Injection. The injection is done in the tuberosity area. Epically. It's, we're going to take our time. If you have a beer around you, just please, if you can bring one to me, that will be great. Palatal injection. A very low apical palatal injection, because at the time that you are reflecting the mucosa in the sinus, you have some remaining pain when you elevate, when you start to elevate one, one centimeters or around that. On the palatal side, you have to add more injection, anesthesia on the palatal side. So do it at the, at the beginning, that, that, is, that is better. So mucosa is reflected. Incision is done medially to the last teeth. Reflection of full thickness for sure, full thickness reflection. And this is the area. You can see that the, we have been cleaning here the inflammatory cells, the inflammatory reaction that you had on the crest. The sinus window was open here with a with a saw with a piezo saw. Start to move. This is the micro saw. We use the diamond burr, the diamond piezo sorry insert, rectangular one, in order to achieve to move all the residual spines of bone that could be still connected. And now, this is what we call in French elephant leg. I don't know how to translate that in English. I don't know if it's the same word in English, but this one is required to push the, uh, to, to release from the periphery of the osteotomy, to release from the walls and not from the window. So we're releasing, you know, the attachment of the wall. So the new one has uh, a hole in the middle and water pressure in the middle. It seems to be a good idea because then it may push the mucosa, but do not use it. You will tear the membrane with the pressure of the water. It happens to me, so I dropped it and then now I'm using only the flat one without any pressure in the middle. We are removing the window. Here it's not a very thin uh, sinus. The wall is a little bit more thin thick than the one that we saw before. You can see on the lower side, the lower part, that we need to correct also the crest. There is a GBR which has to be done at the same time on the apical side to rebuild the crest. So we remove the window. We finish releasing the walls. You see here in this situation we have a thick wall and it's very interesting to remove the window rather than leaving it in place or reflecting it in place. More the wall is thick, the, the more you need to remove the window. You see in some areas it's not really, really... Where, where it's dark it's a weak area. Where, where the darkness is, you know, where the gray color is, it's a great area. This is a fantastic tool, does not exist anymore. It's 180, uh, 180 degrees back. And this is probably, if I had to go on a desert island, maybe this one I will take it with me. After we reflect in a conventional way, with a beer. Do Canadian people drink a lot of beer? 
yeah but it, it depends i mean we like a lot of different uh types of beer but uh Watching a sinus lift, sinus lift I mean, is yeah, it's, it's something a harsh, you know. And ju just to be serious again, um, seeing the mucosa moving does not mean that it's not teared. M mostly it is considered as being a test. It's a false test because even if it's broken, you know, it will move anyhow. And if it's broken in the, in the anterior area, just behind the kin, the premolar, you will not see it. So the only test that you can have in this area, just inject serum inside and see what happens. If water is coming out from the same area, it means that everything is going well. And at the time that you are bleeding inside the sinus, it means that in the middle and the posterior area, there is no teared membrane. Otherwise, you will not have blood. Blood will go into the sinus. We take the time we need to release the anterior wall. This is the most important and critical area because if it's still connected and you compact the biomaterials, you might break it just with the biomaterials at that time. You see the angle, the angle here is the most important, the most critical place to be reflected. Okay, at that time we can go and fill the, uh, the biomaterial, the bone substitute. Oh, something is happening. Okay, it goes well. The membrane, the bone substitute, here it's a green root graft. And the window is closed and a bone regeneration on the lower crests. I removed it, this is not the subject today. And on the other side, we're gonna do different way. We're gonna do exactly the same elevation. We're gonna place the implants in that 0.6 millimeters and 2.4 millimeters heights. Procedure is the same. Opening the window. Unhappily, we cannot answer to the question because I don't hear it yet. And I hope there are some. Yeah, there are some questions, you know. Eh? Uh, Somebody is asking, are you always using a, a membrane in the sinus? You know, you apply the membrane, but is it the systematic in your practice? Uh, as I told you, I, I don't choose systematically a membrane, but I use a collagen spongy, a large collagen spongy, even if I consider that there is nothing broken in place. Because as I said, at the time that I'm putting the bone substitute, I don't want that the pressure that I'm developing with the bone substitute, if the mucosa is thin, it might break and then having the biomaterial going inside the, the, the sinus. So this is not, uh, the, uh, systematically, every time I use a huge, a big collagen med, uh, spongy inside, if I'm uh, aware, if I think I have something weak or uh, some mucosa weak, or I can see some very dark area or, or small hole, uh, this time I will use mm -hmm. it. You can see here that the, the, uh, the diamond is used. This is the round one. I don't like the round one. I don't like it. Here, I use it just for the show, but it's not really interesting. Otherwise, I had a question on your previous case, and uh, somebody's asking which type of material you were using. I mean, it was a xenograft, and uh, a person would like to know what you uh, used. Uh, which, which case? The, the previous one. The previous one with the infectious, with the infection, with yeah. the complication? Yeah. No, that was allogenic bone, human uh, allogenic uh, Okay, bone. No, but the, 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 the case right after, you, uh, you said that you use a xenograft. Mm. Well, what, what was the kind? I don't uh, remember. I don't remember. Okay, let, let's finish this yeah, one. Let's, let's finish this one. I'll, I'll, let's I will come, come back. back to, uh, I will come back to the, the image. Previous, yeah. Uh, yeah. previous case. And this yeah. one is really interesting because turning around, you know, just retracting, you know, not pulling, just retracting it and just going contact with the wall, you can release all the adherents, all the spines that might be still connected to the window. So those, those are the inserts that, that I use for reflecting it. There are different ones, or you can use manual, or you can use it here with the piezo. Here we are reflecting everything. All the mucosa is reflected with the insert, with the piezo insert, no manual.
Okay, I think in a minute that will be over. When we are preparing a video, you know, it, it's always too quick, but when we are looking at it, it takes time. If we look at the anterior side, and now we are going deep to the anterior part and the, mid, uh, and the middle area. And you have to be very careful using the piezo, never remain activating it without moving. At the time that you are activating the piezo, you must have a movement in order to have the water coming very, very deeply inside. Otherwise, you might tear the membrane by burning it. It might heat, especially when it's inside like that and the water will not arrive. Mm. You can see there is a small tear here. Yeah. And this is due probably to... Uh, at that time, I came back to Emmanuel just to have the contact and they have the feeling exactly of the wall. I used sharp edged curettes. I don't use smooth curettes, only sharp edged one. Because at the time that it's sharp edged one, you can you can easily feel if you are on the bone or if you are just moving on the mucosa. So this way you can more more precise in the control of the reflection. In this situation, for instance, yes, sure, we, we need to have a membrane here. Uh, for less than five millimeters, we can put a membrane and continue the procedure with or without the implants. If it's more than five, we need to suture it and be sure that it's totally closed. Uh, I wanted to show you that, but it would have been taking too much time how we can just suture a membrane. That would be for another time. Now I'm not using a spongy. Here I'm using a membrane. This is a membrane, not a spongy. You have, when you put a spongy, you have just be sure that it's going to cover all the upper part, medial part, and lower part also. And controlling that it is not really packed inside, but it's covering, you know, it's a cover. So push it to retract it, push it to retract it, be sure that it's totally adapted to the mucosa. It takes time. So I control here by with a small insert sucking inside and trying to see if I can still see something which is not covered by the membrane. And now we go for drilling. And prepare the site. As you can see, I don't go very quick. I move just 300 uh, round per minute. 400 not more than that and we don't need to be you know very deep just entering the crest preparing it goes very quickly at that time we use the countersink and we don't choose the countersink till the end it will stop before the dark line you, you need to have the compression of the implants. Normally when you use this countersunk for those who are not used to this implant, we use it until the, uh, here you can see it, we use it until the dark line is connected to the bone on the level, depending on the density, we go to the, to the first part of the line or to the second part of the line, or insert it deeply or not. Here it does not go inside, just a few millimeters. I want to keep the compression of the conical implant. Here, just to be clear enough, I will not use a cylinder implant, cylindric implant. It will be only a conical implant. Remember here we had something like 1.6, 1.8 millimeters thickness for the first implant and something like 2.4 millimeters for the second one. This is, Jerome, what we were supposed to have for life surgery when we planned to do it together. Definitely. Next time. So the type of material you are using? This is a xenograft. Is this, a is, xen this is xeno, yeah. Xenograft. Yeah. This is xeno. I might choose, because at that time, you know, I, I didn't have enough, uh, you know, feedback on the, uh, the BCPs. Probably today I may use BCP also. 
Yeah, we can see it's a very spongy material. Yeah, it is. And it's very porous. We can see it's, you know, you can see here it's, uh, it remains connected. It's not separated particles. And this is only serum physiological serums. So you probably answered the question of uh, a previous question about the material. So it was the same material that was it used. Was the same. Yeah. It was when I did the left side. Yeah. Okay, the and same the patient. Previous, yeah, the same oh, the previous. Okay, okay, previous, okay sorry. Yeah, uh, I previous. was looking for the previous case. No, no. no same the patient. No. Same patient. A, yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's a xenograft. Yeah. It was the same material yeah. on both sides. Okay. So the sinus field. And now I'm going to use a plugger just to remove all the biomaterials from the window. Mm -hmm. I don't want to put my implant, as I told you, and compress some hydroxylapatite or any biomaterials. I don't want any biomaterials which comes and interfere. You can see. And the first hole, you see how thin it is. Yeah. You probably you saw it on the video or when you look to it, secondary just to make a pose and see it's really 1.5 millimeters, less than 1.5 millimeter. Yeah, the implant is, uh, you know, the micro threaded part of the implant is approximately 3.5 millimeters. So uh, yeah, 3.5, so it's almost the half of it. Yeah, yeah, 1.5 is, is yeah. the half of it. As I told you, you know, uh, with the micro thread, I can count on seven micro threads and I can develop in some cases uh, in dense maxilla. I observed more than 40 Newton, but every time I reach 40 Newton, I reverse and go gently or do the drilling again. I don't want to exceed 30 Newton maximum, maximum, maximum. I don't want to exceed 30 Newton. Some complementary GBR on the surface here because the bone was a little bit thin mm. and the suture and the story is done. Those are the implants in place. You can see the dome on both sides. It means that the biomaterial is still remained under the, uh, the membrane and not protruding. The second implant was 11 millimeters. And here in the situation we had, you can see it on the right, we had the sinus elevation as also the GBR on the palatal yeah. side. Okay. In some other cases, this is a maxillary atrophy. This is to introduce something that we've been talking about that you can find also on Abécédant. We had a previous lecture in French, maybe we'll have to do it in English again, uh, Jérôme, <laughs> about hybrid bone regeneration. I don't want to develop it too much today, this is not the story, but hybrid bone regeneration is based on the same observation that having some dense and non-dense biomaterials connected and connected also uh, mixed with some blood, uh, blood components issue from the PRF. We see here that we have very thin bone in the premaxilla in the sinus area. Sinus is elevated on the right side. A template is used here just to keep spacer. It's a kind of spacer. The GBR and the sinus are achieved. The GBR here is done with principle of hybrid bone regeneration, which is a mix of alloxenograph and PRF. No membranes, just a spongy on the surface. Membrane is not blocked, but this is a long story. I, I don't have time to discuss about that today. Second site is treated from the same, with the same procedure, with the same material. But in this situation, I have put in this case not to show you a GBR or something like that. I never put immediate implant placement under a full prosthesis in the maxilla. It always, always end, at least with crystal bone resorption and in a bad way, it could have implant migration into the sinus. Even if you can feel that you have, I mean, if you have three to four millimeters, I think it's safer. Rebuild the bone, put the implant in place, because if you have one complication, it's dramatical to go and remove it, because you have all the biomaterials, you have the GBR, you have the sinus elevated. The risk is too high to take a chance to have this implant migrating inside. So every time that you have pressure of a prosthesis, do not put any implant which can compress the area. If you have teeth, you can count on the teeth, but if it's full arch, it's not safe. I mean in the sinus area. In the anterior, it's another story. And this is how it ends with the bone regeneration. Implants are in place in the sinus. Implants are in place in the GBR area. This is the re-entry for the second step surgery. Bone volume is maintained. And this is something with a follow-up of three, four years. And this is the CT scan with the bone volume maintained at four years. 
CT scan at six years, we still have the bone volume and especially we still have the angles. The angles, you can see that it's not round, it's not remodeled. We still have, uh, you know, angles around the implants in the area of the GBR. And this is very specific from the hybrid bone regeneration. This is something that lasts, I think, in my opinion, it might, it might last like in the sinus and be independent all over the time. And now we have to end up this story and promise you that next step will be step two, will be the posterior maxilla atrophy reconstruction. Here you have one case which might be interesting to follow, but it's a little bit too late for tonight and then we have to report it for another session. Thank you for your attention. So we do have time for a few questions, I think. Yeah. Depends. I, I didn't observe my wash. What is it? Mm. Uh, it's still <laughs> yeah, it's still, it's still early, but we started late. I mean, we'll, uh, we'll end up, uh, yeah, by continuing a little bit. So let's go with the first question uh, on the diagnostic part of the treatment. I mean, uh, you discussed uh, about the importance of uh, doing a CBCT scan before uh, any type of procedure uh, that will affect um, the sinus region and uh, do you systematically assess the osteum patency before touching the sinus? This is a recommendation from the French Society of Oral Surgery and this is a requirement for the insurance. If you have any problem in France, I mean, if you have any problem in France and you don't have the observation of the osteum and the freedom of the canal of the channel, channel osteum, in this situation, your responsibility might be, you know, compromised. Um, you have to see what is happening because if you have bleeding, if you have a small infection, the patient needs to just to, to, to blow his nose and just evacuate the mucus or the, the, uh, the, the, hemato, the hemosinus or whatever. He needs just to have it free. Otherwise, it will be confined inside. And like the, the, the first situation when you had a confined, you know, uh, uh, anatomy, with some retention inside the sinus, you will have the same problem and that will lead to major infection with the, with the biomaterials, with the bone substitute inside. Okay, one question uh, on one of your very, very first case. I mean, you have been using some cover screws, some uh, healing abutments, and uh, is there a, a criteria that will uh, dictate which kind of uh, surgery you will do? Yeah, what, uh, there are... I, I, if you just having like that in my mind, there are for me two main reasons using one or the other. Uh, bone stability first. If you have bone stability around 25 to 30 Newton, then you can have a healing abutment. If you don't have a temporary prosthesis, just pressing on it. Okay, it's another story. Not any pressure on the implant, even if it's a long implant, we don't have to have a prosthesis laying on it. Spe except in the, in, the, in, the, in the chin, but this is not the area we are dealing about. Uh, the second story is the soft tissue. You have to consider the soft tissue. If you have a lack of soft tissue, you, it will be better to cover the implant and do a, a translated flap, a split thickness translated flap, or do a, a, a gingival graft at the second time surgery during that second period after the implant healing. I think, in my opinion, you cannot reflect a flap, compromise the bone, and augment the keratinite tissue at the same time. You can make it thicker put a gingival graft, you know, a connective tissue graft and making the thicker of the bone. But if you need to have uh, a bigger surgery or a more important surgery or augment the keratinite tissue, better having it just submerged and doing that in a second step. Thank you. And I have another question uh, on the type of uh, material you're using. You report bone loss in time using allograft spongy bone in sinus floor uh, elevation. Does allograft corticocancellous bone provides better biomechanical properties uh, through time? Yeah, definitely it provides better mechanical properties, but depending what do you mean by cortical. And this is a long story. If you consider cortical coming from, you know, the femoral head, mm, it's much more a cartilaginous dense bone than a cortical bone. Uh, just go to, to a book of anatomy and try to see the histology of this area and try to find where is the cortical bone. There are very few of it. So if it's harvested, you know, from that area, uh, you might have some risk. You will not have a bigger difference having using using a spongy bone or a cortical spongy bone. Probably you will have a few years more, but this is uh, this is not really significant. Uh, 
if you have it harvested from other parts of the body like long bones that you have from other you know uh, companies actually uh, available in france uh, you may have more longer stability inside but my main consideration in the sinus it's not important if you use bone because at the time that the envelope is done by the pristine bone you lose bone from the upper side i don't speak about i'm not talking about periimplantitis i'm speaking about bone remodeling in this situation your implant will not be compromised if you are using this biomaterial on the surface to create a new envelope and it resorbs this is definitely another story because at that time you will uncover parts of the implants threads or surface and you may lead to other complications like infections and uh, you know preimplantitis related to the exposure of the implant surface uh, so if we take on consideration what i told about the biomaterials and the sinus we cannot just extrapolate that and use it exactly the same on the surface just i want to be very precise on that if you use cortico spongy bone we've been using from the calvaria or whatever in the sinus it worked well in the calvaria it was really stable on time inside the sinus but even the calvaria on the surface resorbs so depending on what is the target but into the sinus yes you can use cortico spongy my main consideration also for the sinus using a cortico spongy uh, i use allogenic bone in the sinus when i have some doubt about the infection risk of the patient a tiered membrane or anatomical reason or history of sinusitis then i will use allogenic bone because of the 30 percent collagen matrix but in this case i will definitely never use a cortical bone because if i use cortical bone if i have an infection it will turn dramatically in time i prefer to use spongy one just by itself and if i need to have something more dense the question is why am i using allogenic bone in this situation i can go to a, to a bcp which works in a good way into the sinus and it start to be nonsense using it into the sinus Ooh, we have a few questions coming and uh, i'm not sure we're going to have time to answer uh, all of them but uh, at least i would like to uh, pick up some questions concerning yeah the prf we saw a, a glimpse of a membrane at the end of your presentation how often do you use it in the sinus or in the gbr uh, in the sinus in let's the sinus, say, no, let's yeah, say in the well, sinus we'll let's not focus go on the sinus in yeah. the sinus when i have a doubt about um, you know the integrity of the mucosa if i have the doubt before i will do just a prf and just having it in my hands uh, help me rather than using a membrane i will use it but definitely honestly i don't feel any different using prf using a membrane so if i'm planning to put a membrane inside because i have anatomical risk i will prepare a prf and use it and if i have a tiered membrane during the surgery i will not corrupt i will not take any chance to have any septic problems going and having uh, a blood uh, a blood prf uh, done during the surgery or i prepared it before i just harvest it before or i will not harvest it during the surgery so using a membrane if something happens that i did not expect i'll use a membrane if i'm expecting something maybe in this situation i will use some prf in, in order to be sure that i will obtain safe uh, safe closure especially for small you know small rupture for small uh, the difference also if you are planning to do what we call a loma linda envelope so putting a membrane and just covering all the mucosa and going outside and stabilizing with pins mm. definitely you can choose a prf so in this situation if you have something like that in plan in hands in head uh, probably you will better use a membrane than plan to use a prf which will not be helpful in this situation i have another question uh, uh, yeah concerning uh, osseodensification you know the OCO densification protocol with uh, those high-speed bursts. What do you think about it? Uh, we heard a lot of things, but uh, I don't have a clear uh, opinion myself. Maybe you have. So, for my opinion, uh, OCO uh, condensation is is an interesting procedure. is very interesting. I think in D1, D2, uh, sorry, in D2 to D3 bone, but definitely I prefer to have a control of the uh, you know the 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 impaction and the elevation if for instance if i have a d1 d2 bone i will not use osseo densification because in this situation we will increase the torque and will increase the inflammatory reaction and the bone resorption if you have a d3 d4 it's quite a good indication for that 
Yes, I have. Um, I have a funny one. I think probably maybe the last one for uh, uh, for tonight, but uh, probably somebody that got a problem at some point. And uh, are we able? Uh, the, the, the guy is asking, are we able in France as dentists to go? into the sinus and remove the implant ourselves? Or do we need to do it uh -huh. or refer it, do it in a special this structure? Is, yes, uh, this is a very, this is a very interesting. I was asked about that same question that was during, uh, it was during a consensus uh, day organized at CFAC. There were some, uh, some medical guys from, from the medical staff and some from the dental staff. And I showed the, the cases where I went and removed cysts from the sinus, you know, uh, non-tumoral cysts, you know, inflammatory uh, polyps or whatever. And at the same time, just in releasing the, uh, just um, entering the sinus, removing the, the inflammation, the cyst, clothing the mucosa and rebuilding, doing the, uh, the, the sinus elevation, for example. And I was asked the same question. And uh, the idea is very simple. If during the surgery your implant goes into the sinus, do you go to try to take it or not? I think definitely no one will tell you why did you enter the sinus to remove the implant that you have just placed inside. No one will ask you for that. And the question is more, are you equipped for that? Do you have a good light? Do you have good tools for that? And at the time that you start to do sinus surgery, you cannot stop and do minimal sinus surgery. If you have to go for that, you have to have a full training in order to be able to do the maximum you can. For sure, if the implant is on the third part, upper part of the sinus, you will never can catch it. Not, not anyone can catch it going from the uh, Caldwell-Luke approach. You have to go from the nasal side. So going from the nasal side to enter the sinus, definitely it's not our prerogative, but going from the lateral side and entering the sinus, removing something that you have placed in, or removing an infection, we do it just every time. We do it at the hospital, we do it at my office. I was doing that you know, from the beginning of the, of the sinus elevations. I feel really comfortable with that. But you have to achieve to know what you are doing and to be sure what is the protocol. The protocol is not only the, the surgery, it's the medication. When do you control the patient? How often do you see the patient? When do you do x-ray controls? You cannot do x-ray control every week to see the patient. You cannot do that. So you have to have a full you know, training. At the time that you have the full training for that, the good tools, good lights, and then, uh, not good luck, sorry, good lights. Mm. And then at the time you can, you can go for that. Mm. I learned a very good rule of thumb with Pascal Valentini, who has a lot of experience with sinus surgery. And he was teaching us um, during my post uh, our postgraduate studies, he was teaching us, okay, you can do many things in the sinus, uh, but be sure that you are able to manage the complication. The complication. Yeah. It's, it's all the story for all the surgeries. Exactly. So. Uh, uh, it's a nice way also to say hello to, uh, to Pascal. But I would like to say thank you to many, many people because uh, I think uh, it will be the end of part one for, uh, for tonight. And I think we have to stop for that. We may have a part two. Uh, we have to plan it. We, we have to plan it, but the part two may, <laughs> may, come, uh, may come soon. But uh, anyway, thank you for tonight. Sorry, we started a little bit uh, late, but uh, finally, uh, I think uh, people were uh, connected and uh, I think it was a great session. So, uh, of course, special thanks to the Peers uh, Friends member. And hello to our friends from the Peers and then yeah, hope I, next time that will be your turn to, to do it. I know they are watching us. Uh, I would like to, uh, to say thank you to the to the technical team, to uh, Abécédent Eugénol, to uh, Jérôme Lipovic, Romain uh, Sirica, uh, to uh, the translator. Yes, and there was a, a translation provided. So uh, Annie Malherbe, thank you very much for providing uh, a transla uh, translation for both of us, actually. And I would like to take the opportunity also to say thank you to Sherian Farad, which is she's my colleague, you know, in yeah. the uh, in the post grad that you are providing together with the EDS. I would like to thank her. She helped me a lot for, for, every, for everything that I'm doing, you know, 
regarding the lectures and the presentation. So. Yeah, and of course, thank you very much to the Nelsplice Sirona team, especially Frédéric Debel, Bettina Lamp, and Bettina was uh, quite implicated in uh, tonight's session. And uh, uh, a spe special thanks to uh, two colleagues. First of all, Agneta Braberg Jansson. We've been working together for many, many years, and she provided key elements for the presentation until very, very late tonight. And one very special thanks to uh, Stig Hansen, uh, yeah. yeah, it provided... He came back to us yesterday. Yeah, he came back to us and I, I was discussing with George and uh, I, I told him, oh, I mean, uh, those are elements that we do find in Stig Hansen's uh, doctoral thesis and actually I got a copy of uh, Stig Hansen's... Yeah, I'm jealous. I, I think if you don't put it in your pocket, I will steal it from you. Yeah, it will be on <laughs> eBay uh, in a few minutes, so if you want to buy okay. from me. <laughs> so uh, actually, yeah, uh, special... Uh, my warmest regards to uh, Stig Hansen. I mean, uh, he has done an incredible uh, uh, work on the implant development and he explained a lot the importance of the micro threads and things and the like biomechanics, that. All the biomechanics. The, the biomechanics. The, the, the so, uh, if you haven't uh, read any paper by Stig Hansen, I think uh, it's. Uh, it's something you should definitely do, especially if you like oral implantology. So, thank you very much, and, uh, and thanks to you too. Thank you, Jean Sebastien. Yeah. Thank you, all of you. Thank all of you. Yeah. Thank you, Jerome. Arnaud. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. See you later, and hope to share with you again. <laughs>